Not, not my partner for long, unfortunately, because he's uh, he's leaving us to um, uh, join the faculty at Oklahoma. But I've, I've wanted to have him on for a while uh, just because he's really a master um, spine surgeon and uh, particularly really good at uh, deformity. And I thought his topic for today was going to be really interesting. So, um, you know, he's going to go over a few cases of um, uh, patients with uh, mucopolysacr... Uh, I'll just say MPS, Hurler syndrome. <laughs> and uh, Isaac, feel free to, uh, you know, uh, ask questions of the audience. You know, we're pretty good about uh, moderating the, uh, the chat box. Okay. Uh, you know, Mike, uh, Matt, and Alex are all able to chime in as well. And um, uh, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to join us. So sure, thank you. Can I go ahead and share my screen? Certainly. Okay. It says the host is able to uh, participate in screen sharing. I think Mike should be able to fix that. Um, Here, try, try it now. Yep, uh, we're in business. Okay, let me know if you can see my uh, slides now. Can you? Looks great. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Koi, for the inv special invitation. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I had a chance to review some of the videos of the prior talks, and uh, it's amazing the amount of educational uh, material that you all have uh, covered over the, the last several years. So congratulations to, to all of you uh, for this fantastic um, case conference. So I chose this uh, topic, uh, spinal deformities in uh, MPS syndromes, in that uh, the reason is that um, I um, have had a, a privilege of taking care of um, a fair number of uh, these kids uh, over my last uh, seven and a half years at Duke. Um, and uh, these uh, patients have a special place in my heart. And uh, I, they are perhaps um, the, the most rewarding uh, group of patients that I've, I've had a pleasure of taking care of. And also it has allowed me to also learn from my pediatric colleagues as well. So the cases that I'll present today are not necessarily wild deformities, but they are actually just routine uh, cases that routine pathology that you see in um, patients with MPS syndrome. So there's really nothing special about these deformities. It's just what you see uh, in uh, MPS syndrome. So I'll share some of my uh, experience with uh, with this. Let me just provide some background because uh, most of us haven't thought about MPS syndrome since probably uh, USMLE step one days. And so just to refresh uh, our memory a bit. So uh, MPS are a group of inherited disorders. They are caused by incomplete degradation and storage of acid uh, mucopolysaccharides or glycoaminoglycans. Uh, there are seven distinct clinical subtypes and several uh, cl uh, clinical types and several uh, uh, subtypes. Um, but the main types are type one through four, type six, type seven, and type nine. Uh, the type that we'll talk about today is uh, type one, which is Hurler syndrome, which is caused by a deficiency in the enzyme uh, ifa uh, iodoronidase which leads to an accumulation of dermatin and heparin sulfate in all of the different uh, connective tissues and soft tissues in the body. The incidence is still rare. It's about one in 100,000 in the population. So the uh, spinal pathology that we see in MPS syndrome can be explained by this uh, chart that you see here. So basically, you have accumulation of glycoaminoglycans in uh, the different uh, tissues here. So primarily in chondrocytes, which will affect both primary and secondary ossification that leads to some of the skeletal abnormalities that you see that creates the skeletal deformities. Uh, there's also accumulation of glycoaminoglycans in ligament uh, and joint capsules, which leads to ligamentous laxity, hypermobility that ultimately uh, contributes to the development of thoracal lumbar kyphosis uh, and scoliosis. And then uh, again, uh, involvement in the connective tissues leads to uh, deposition of these um, uh, uh, aminoglycans and uh, some of the extra uh, dural space that can also lead to uh, spinal canal stenosis. Uh, some of the radiographic hallmarks that, uh, that you encounter are shown here. So uh, typically, uh, it's not uncommon that you see uh, both a C1 and odontoid hypoplasia. Uh, characteristically, there's anterior beacon of the vertebral body, just about in most of these uh, kids with this pathology. 
um, the vertebral bodies have this special shape, they're flattened, uh, so a, a term called a plate is um, There's posterior scalloping of the, of the vertebral bodies, and uh, almost always, especially in Hurler's um, uh, syndrome, uh, severe Hurler's syndrome, almost always, at least 80 to 90% of the kids will have uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis, sometimes with concomitant cervical thoracic kyphosis. So the first case that I will uh, present is the case of cervical thoracic kyphosis and lumbar spondylolisthesis that uh, I was involved in along with my pediatric colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Fitch, and I believe uh, Richardson, Dr. Bill Richardson also helped with it. So uh, the history is that of a 15-year-old uh, with a history of Hurler syndrome who presented uh, with complaints of neck and upper thoracic pain. Now, when she was four months old, she underwent a stem cell transplant, which is one of the two primary uh, modalities to, uh, to treat uh, Hurler's uh, syndrome, along with enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, she did very, very well, um, did not have any real spinal uh, 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 clinical manifestations. Uh, she was neurologically intact when she presented uh, with the neck and upper thoracic pain. So these are her clinical uh, imaging. So I can go through this and move um, this to the side. So you can see, um, Corey, should I, should I go through the images or should I um, pause here? Isaac, we may have Wendy logged in. Wendy's our neuroradiologist from Mayo Clinic. Wendy, are, are you logged in? I think I just allowed you into the waiting room before. Uh, I, I don't, I don't hear her. So, um, I, you could probably no, proceed Isaac. I, she, she may not be logged in yet. No problem. All right. If you look to the left of the image, it's a standing lateral x-rays, um, that were taken when she presented with her neck pain and, um, uh, upper thoracic pain. And it's not very clear there, but if you look to the far right, there's a more close up uh, shot of her cervical thoracic junction. And you can appreciate a uh, substantial cervical thoracic kyphosis, uh, in this case, measuring approximately 122 degrees. The apex of the kyphosis here is T2. Um, so subsequently, an MRI uh, was performed. Uh, the MRI was performed for different reasons, and I can uh, go through that uh, later on once we talk about the treatment options. But it's critical to obtain an MRI before um, you um, uh, deploy some of your treatment strategies. Uh, although she was neurologically intact, it, it is still important. So you can see on the MRI that uh, her cord is draped over the apex of the kyphosis, but there's no uh, intra, uh, intraparenchymal uh, abnormalities that I can uh, pick up on the MRI. And neurologically, she was uh, intact as well. The CT scan is super helpful because it provides just superior anatomic details. Again, you can see the abnormal shape of the vertebral bodies and how small the vertebral bodies are, which creates a significant challenge um, in a, a spinal instrumentation uh, in this, uh, in this uh, patient population. Uh, this is just this uh, 3D reconstruction, which can sometimes be very helpful. So at this point, you know, she's complaining of um, pain, uh, neck pain, upper thoracic pain. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't have any x-rays uh, prior to compare with, but she had an MRI from when she was about four years old. And when you compare that MRI at four years old to her MRI at 15 years old, that's a dramatic, I didn't mean, show you, but it's a dramatic change in, it, um, in the magnitude of her kyphosis. So uh, this is what we're left with now. So the question is, what do we do with, with her at this point? So. I will pause here and solicit some um, opinions for the group from the group. Isaac, I'm curious. At at Duke, do you all do um, traction in house with patients? Like, are you able? Do you have that capacity to do that at Duke? Yes, uh, we do. It's not very common, uh, but the setup is not as good as other places that I've uh, been or trained. Like, uh, it's not set up even as nearly as good as WashU, or even as uh, certainly nowhere. Uh, close to what uh, what they have at Focus Hospital in Ghana, where I um, I visit frequently to um, to to uh, learn some of these uh, uh, pathologies. 
Right. I, I mean, I think looking at this, I think that might be something reasonable to try first is just to see how much correction that you could get, because obviously you said the patient's neurologically intact, but this is a very, it's a very dangerous operation, uh, you know, with, with that acute angulation of the spinal cord draping over those upper thoracic vertebral bodies. So, so I'm, I may do a trial of, of in-house traction maybe for a couple of weeks. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but, um, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you did for this ultimately? Then, then I think she's probably going to end up requiring some kind of three-column osteotomy, maybe uh, you know the apex, two or three of those vertebral bodies there at the apex of that um, of that kyphus. Okay, uh, that's a very good point. So you you essentially nailed it. So the next slide is exactly what you mentioned, uh, which is uh, halogravity traction. So traction is is so important. I mean, I cannot over um, overstate the, the, the role that traction can play in the treatment of uh, these complex uh, spinal deformities. So the picture you see to the right are, is actually copied from uh, Focus of Orthopedic Hospital, um, uh, which is founded by Dr. Henry Babuachi and is uh, stationed in Accra, uh, Ghana, which is my home country. So I oftentimes, uh, every year, I have the privilege of going to the hospital and, and learning uh, how to take care of some of these spinal uh, deformities. Uh, so halo gravity traction is uh, incredibly is beneficial in the treatment and pre-surgical optimization of patients with rigid deformities. Uh, it achieves approximately about 30 to 40 percent reduction in the curve magnitude in, in most of the reported series, and that's my experience as well. Uh, the duration typically is between four to six weeks um, in places that have a very good setup, um, uh, and I'm glad you asked that question. The complication rates actually is fairly low. Uh, most of the encounter complications are usually due to pin siding uh, infections. Uh, the typical protocol is uh, you start your weight typically at 20% of the uh, of the body weight, and then you increase by 10% each week until the patient until you reach about 50% uh, of the patient's uh, body weight. And typically, that can be accomplished roughly uh, within four weeks. And uh, in some of the series that have been published from, from Focus uh, Hospital, they usually are able to achieve 50% of the body weight by four, four weeks. So this is an example of, a, this is not this patient that we, we are presenting, but it's an example of um, how traction can make a huge difference. Uh, this is a patient from Focus Hospital. You can see uh, severe uh, uh, thoracic kyphosis um, so here which measured 145 degrees, but uh, after six weeks in traction, uh, the magnitude uh, curve has dropped significantly to 72. And if you just pay attention to the morphology, the patient's body, just look at the, the base of the skull relative to the top of, the, of that uh, uh, deformity. And you can see from, uh, pre, from pre-traction to post-traction, uh, the, the significant separation, the distance, the gap between the base of the skull and, and um, the, the, the deformity. So uh, traction is um, very, very important. And in fact, um, it has uh, led them to move away from three-column osteotomies these days. And so it's actually rare that they actually perform VCRs or PSOs for these deformities. They are doing more traction. And then uh, as long as they can get the deformity uh, uh, down substantially uh, with the traction and with intraop, uh, you know, pontial osteotomies, so, you know, they are able to avoid three column osteotomies and still get very good uh, radiographic and clinical results. So this is the patient uh, that I'm presenting today. So you can see this is the pre-op traction x-rays on the left. Uh, this is day two traction x-rays in the middle uh, with 10 pounds of traction. Uh, you can see that the carb magnitude now has decreased uh, from uh, 122 now to 77 and then um, and then after seven days with 15 pounds, uh, it has gone down to uh, 77. Uh, now this patient was treated for a total of two weeks of traction. She couldn't tolerate any more uh, after two weeks. And so it was decided that she had uh, maximized uh, her traction uh, capabilities and uh, was then uh, sent uh, for definitive uh, surgery. So th this is an interop uh, image to the far right. It's an interop. Um, uh, image that shows if you compare her pre-traction and the interop uh, traction x-rays with 20 pounds of traction, you can appreciate uh, substantial improvement in her deformity, uh, which actually then impacts your clinical, your surgical uh, approach, in my opinion. So 
Um, Isaac, can I, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. How do you go about ensuring that that you maintain that correction that you've achieved over the previous two to four weeks intraoperatively when you position them, put them in the prone position, take them from, you know, upright halo gravity traction to, you know, prone traction? Oh, once you position them and put the traction back on, uh, because they always kept, the kids always kept in traction the whole time. Uh, uh, the whole, uh, you know, for this for this patient, the whole two weeks, or at you know, in other scenarios for the six weeks or for you know, four to six weeks, and the traction is is maintained up to the to the time where they get uh, into the operating room. When after positioning, you add on back the weights, and uh, uh, the uh, the correction is still maintained. Right. Okay. All right. So. Um, now that we know what the traction has done for this uh, deformity, uh, what are what is our surgical plan? Do we do a posterior uh, only surgery? Do we do anterior posterior? Do we do some osteotomies? And what levels uh, do we uh, consider in this uh, patient? Out of curiosity, how big are these lateral masses here? Or can you get 12 or 14s in here? Or they look very pretty small. Question. Yeah, very small, very small. Um, so you've asked a very important question. And this is part of the, the challenges of taking care of, you know, some of the, the syndromic uh, patients. The bone uh, density sometimes is not good. It, uh, the size of the bones are very small. Uh, but for the most part, you're still able to get some, um, some screws that, uh, oftentimes, uh, they, they will still hold for the most part. So uh, you can get, these are small labral masses, but you can get between 10 to 12 in them, actually. I mean, my my opinion, you're, if it was, um, you know, if it was me, I, I think I'd probably have to take the patient up to C2. I don't know how confident I would be unless you have other tricks in your bag as far as, you know, using, you know, um, hook and wire constructs and whatnot around the lamina at the subaxial levels. I'm thinking you're probably going to have to take this patient up to at least C2 and then probably a few levels down below that kyphus there. Whether or not you do a three-level VCR, I mean, I think you'd get a better correction if you did, um, you know, I think, what is that, T1 and T2 VCR yeah. there? The apex uh, is, the apex that is that um, is T2. T2, okay. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, you, you may be able to get away with just doing some posterior column osteotomies here and getting a very reasonable correction. I mean, the intra-op looks like the horizontal gaze would be would be pretty reasonable if you would be able to um, kind of recapitulate that and lock them in place in that position. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, Isaac is a, a fantastic case. I'm a little bit speechless because uh, if you even want to achieve fusion, you need a bony surface, and I, I see only cartilage. I see joint. Um, it's it's uh, pretty hard for me um, to have a good concept. Uh, I wonder um, how um, uh, fusion will will be feasible. Uh, I think um, Mike has uh, made some good suggestion to to go long segment. To, um, to graft a lot to these uh, tiny bones. It's, uh, it's difficult for me. I have never treated these kind of syndromes and I'm really looking forward. I, I think I kind of give a, a really good um, suggestion what is, what is good. I'm, I'm a listener today. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, Mike, your, your suggestion is dead on. I think that, um, that uh, getting good fixation points is always a struggle. Uh, although sometimes, you know, sometimes we may gamble and try to go, you know, short uh, with the hope that, you know, things hold and, you know, preserve motion segments because she's only 15 at this time. And, you know, taking her all the way to C2 could be uh, quite morbid, but sometimes you just have to pull the trigger and, and uh, give the patient the best biomechanical construct that, that will hold. So um, the approach that was chosen uh, for this patient by uh, my pediatric colleague uh, was to do uh, a little bit of a shorter segment. So uh, he was able to go to uh, C5. Um, he attempted to get uh, pedicle screws at C7, but um, he just couldn't do it because the, the pedicles were tiny and sporadic. And then the LIV was uh, T5 uh, here. So just by taking advantage of the um, intraoperative traction, he was able to just uh, do a posterior um, instrumentation only without any 
uh, Pontio Steotomies. But um, as you know, this, uh, this is this usually is not the, the end of the of the story. <laughs> the story continues. Um, so the patient comes back. Uh, she does well the first you know several months, and then six months later she comes back for clinic, uh, uh, to clinic. And on her standing X-rays, you can see that already uh, she's starting to fail at the top, um, which is reminiscent of, uh, uh, which brings back your point that maybe uh, you should have went to C2 or we should have went to C2 to begin with as well. All right, so um, if you look at the pre-op pre X-rays compared to six weeks post-op X-rays actually looked very good. Um, patient was doing fine, uh, symptoms were, were had resolved. But then the, the badness began at six months uh, post-op. And you can see that there is now uh, uh, proximal cervical uh, kyphosis, uh, which was non-existent. She was very lodotic at the top, but now she's uh, kyphotic at the top, measuring about 17 uh, degrees. So uh, Mike, since you've been tackling this now, um, you decided to go to C2, but then you changed your mind at the last minute. You went to C5, and then now you're having to pay for it. So what do you do? <laughs> well, I, I think you've got to go up to C2. But um, I, like, I'm always very weary with my um, deformity cases to end with a lateral mass screw. Um, you know, when my residency, we would routinely end at C3, and then we would see something like this. So as an attending, I almost always go up to C2. Um, I might even augment this with like a sublaminar band or something like that, just, just a little belt and suspenders for a case like this, just because you're really asking a lot. Since you haven't performed three-column osteotomy, you've only done traction and some PCOs there. So I would probably augment the top of it, maybe with some sublaminar bands underneath C2 as well. I think the other thing you could do too that I've done in a few of my deformity cases Again, I don't know how much surface area there is, but you could potentially put four screws into C2 and some adults with large C2 segments. You could sometimes get bilateral translaminars in, a couple of pedicle screws as well. I, I suspect that's not going to be feasible in these hypoplastic bones, though. Mike, would you consider doing any anterior? Yeah, I, I don't think that's unreasonable to do that here. Sure. I think you could probably see if you could sneak a few ACDF cages in as well to, you know, to, to help out uh, make this a bit more of a robust construct. Isaac, is this pretty flexible? Uh, just one second. Um, I thought I had a flexibility x-rays. Just give me one second. I think, uh, yep, so it's coming up. All right. Good question. It's coming up. All right, so believe it or not, at six months with, with this x-rays, um, the discussion um, to proceed with surgery um, occurred with a patient and family, and the patient elected to actually, uh, the family decided to, to observe, just to wait, uh, and did not want uh, uh, surgery at this time. So now she comes back one year post-op. And you can see now she's really having difficulty holding the head upright, neck hurts like crazy, uh, deformity is worse. So I still think that based on Mike, um, your assessment is, is dead on. Um, you have to go to C2. Uh, now you may have to consider maybe an anterior. So Matt, um, this is um, the flexibility x-ray. So this is what it looks like in extension and in supine lateral to the right. Would you do anything different, um, Matt? Would you now go, go with all posterior or would you consider doing the anterior supplementation here? Well, I think, I mean, it, it you know, it clearly is uh, somewhat flexible, but it's, but it's begging for something anterior now. I mean, um, you know, that supine getting to eight degrees, you know, again, with this small bone, and I don't treat uh, uh, kids with this, so I don't know how, how what the biology is like, but um, yeah, really, I mean, you got to go up to at least two, if not more, and, uh, and you got to be thinking about maybe something anterior. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. Uh, my rule of thumb always is if I'm treating, uh, especially a kid like this, if, if you fail one time and I'm going to do a revision the second time, I just have to design the best possible surgery because I don't want to put the kid through a third surgery. And so um, if uh, it looks like an anterior will be very feasible here. So anterior supplementation to protect 
the lateral mass groups in these tiny lateral masses uh, could be critical. And so uh, that's what um, uh, uh, was done here. You can see that there's a, a three level um, uh, ACDF was performed uh, combined with extension of the instrumentation of C2, which uh, was able to uh, correct the deformity. Immediate post-op, her shoulders were a little bit off balance, but over time she was able to um, balance it uh, very well. So um, it looks like fairly uh, reasonable correction, uh, which uh, so far has held even up to uh, now six, almost 67 year post-op, she hasn't had any more cervical uh, issues. All right, so now she comes back six years post-op. Um, so uh, this is a classic case of um, uh, patients with MPS syndromes. Um, their, their first surgery is never their last surgery in terms of their spinal surgeries. Uh, uh, when, uh, the moment you finish with the uh, uh, um, you know, C12 or occipital cervical, uh, subaxial cervical spine breaks down, cervical thoracic breaks down, thoracolumbar becomes an issue, uh, lumbar stenosis become an issue. So it's, it's never ending um, uh, uh, issues with, with that. So six years, uh, she comes back complaining of worse than low back pain with uh, left uh, L5 radiculopathy, uh, neurologically intact otherwise. So these are her x-rays uh, when uh, she presented. And I just wanna draw your attention here um, to her lumbar, to her lumbar x-ray. You can see that area with the, uh, uh, grade 2.5 or whatever you want to call it, spondylolisthesis, as we, we call them that L, L4-5, okay? Um, if you look a little bit higher up, um, there's another area here at, this is L1-2, that's a small area of spondylolisthesis um, at this level as well. But her symptoms were strictly in the low back and isolated L5 radiculopathy, no other symptoms, um, that could be attributed to anything at L12 or any of the proximal levels. This is the MRI of her uh, of her lumbar spine. And you can see she does have some spinal stenosis at L34, L23, um, but she doesn't have any clinical symptoms that you can pinpoint to that level. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this was a, a little bit of challenging. This is when I actually jump into her care um, in terms of um, what to treat and how high to treat. Um, one of the things that uh, clinical perils for treating these patients is that if you look at on her MRI from her skull to her to her sacrum, you will find spinal, you will find radiographic abnormalities. But the trap is not to chase after every finding. And so you still want to limit the surgeries to the only the symptomatic um, levels and, and not try to be too, too aggressive uh, in the beginning. And so the question was, can I just get away? Um, with only treating um, the L45 level, or do I need to make it into a, a bigger surgery and, uh, and eventually uh, end up going higher than, than I want to? So uh, any, um, any thoughts here, uh, Mike or Matt or Coy? Yeah, again, I don't, uh, I haven't treated these uh, kids with this, but um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, uh, I think we're all thinking the same thing, which is, you know, with, with what we've done up top, you're going to very quickly get in a position where it, where you're fusing everything, uh, which we really don't want to do. Um, uh, and, but then it's kind of counterintuitive, I think, to most of us to go too short here. So I'm um, I'm excited to see what you did and how it went because I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's certainly okay. certainly it's appealing to try to address the B problem down there, and you know, and, and not get too crazy at least at this point. Yeah, that, that's a good point. This is actually the clinical decision making here was was quite a struggle because I knew her symptoms were mostly coming from the L45 level that, that you see with the, the, the spondylolisthesis. Uh, but I also knew approximately there were radiographic abnormalities. And so I knew that if I chased higher up, then for example, if I went higher up, then that puts me, if you look in the middle image on the on the AP image, that puts me close to the apex of that thoracolumbar scoliosis. It's not a big curve, but my construct will end somewhere in that area. And by the time you know it, I have to connect it to the, you know, the, the proximal construct. So 
um, I, I thought that because the L45 was the, I was convinced that that was her level of uh, pathology, that's the area we chose to uh, address for this surgery. So I ended up just doing um, uh, L45. I had to go to S1 here um, because the L5, you see the vertebral body is very, very small because of the uh, plate is uh, and the pedicles were also very tiny. Uh, but um, I did, um, you know, I was able to get good screws into L4, um, one unilateral screw into L5, and then two um, uh, tricortical S1 screws. Um, I did the uh, discectomy at 4.5 and 5.1, did T-lifts at both levels, and uh, the T-lifts and the discectomy allowed um, me to, to reduce the spondylolisthesis at L4, um, L4.5. And uh, I think this is a one-year post-op. So, so far, uh, so far, so good. But if you look on the image to the right, you can see still the L12, that level. Ultimately, I'm pretty sure that we'll have to extend um, uh, this construct high up. But so far, she, she's doing great. So, uh, Corey, if you're listening, um, <laughs> I've already referred her to you. So, uh, <laughs> so you're on the hook now. <laughs> Isaac, that, that's a fantastic case. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Great. Okay, so the second case is um, a case of thoracoloma kyphosis. This one is a 17-year-old female, uh, also with Herlux uh, syndrome. Uh, now, she um, these are her clinical images. Her first, oh, sorry, to move the screen so I can see. Uh, the top, but anyway, I can't read the top because my, my thing is blocking it. But in any case, um, her first image to the left is when she was at three years old. And uh, as she continued to grow, you can see that over the years, her thoracolumbar deformity continued to progress, which is very uh, classic in uh, patients with uh, NPS uh, syndromes. Uh, and so the image to the right uh, shows the thoracolumbar uh, kyphosis of 57. Uh, 57 degrees. Uh, this is cross table um, flexibility x ray. Uh, I think it's what is it, lateral uh, supine? Oh, I can't see the top, so just uh, please forgive me. But it's a, a flexibility x ray that shows that that deformity is actually quite flexible. And so, whenever it's flexible, then it, it really uh, makes the surgical intervention quite uh, easier to accomplish. And so, this patient underwent uh, a T11 to L5 uh, fusion, did very well uh, for several years until seven years post-op. And this is when I, um, the first surgery was done by my uh, wonderful pediatric um, uh, colleague. And um, I got involved uh, uh, seven years post-op when she presented with this pathology. Now she was having severe problems, um, you know, standing upright, severe back pain, um, can only walk um, a few distances, because, not because of neurological um, complaints, but because of posture-related complaint. You can see dramatic exaggeration of her um, thoracic low doses uh, to you know, compensate for some of her lumbar kyphosis. Uh, this is a, a better shot uh, as to what is going on. Her 5-1 has completely uh, fallen apart. This is what it looks like on the, on the MRI and on the CT scan. The image to the far right is a scout lateral, which is uh, equivalent of a flexibility x-rays, which actually shows that she actually does improve a little bit uh, with uh, when she's supine, um, but still probably not enough to, to get her the, the necessary correction that she needs. So uh, anybody want to tackle this? Do you, do you have a, a, a coronal CT scan just to see if, if this is completely fused or not? Okay, so um, the proximal segments are fused, for, but there's a loosening of the L5 screws are loose. So 4.5 is not, it's not very solid, but the rest of the construct appears to be solid, except for 4.5. I mean, just looking at these select images, I, I'm, I might be inclined to... Um, to do kind of a, one of these back front backs here to, to take out the posterior hardware, loosen things up, release some of the facet joints, 
maybe do, um, you know, a few level of, of a lifts or laterals here, you know, get some anterior height back. And then, um, you're going to have to end up extending her up probably a little bit higher afterwards, but I, I would definitely get, you know, I get a standing film in between though, and see how much correction we get just from getting some intercom support there. Okay. Matt, you like a lift. What do you think? Oh uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> hard to say. Um, the, um, yeah, you can maybe do front back, right? You can maybe go into the front, do an A lift, and do, um, uh, if the, you know, where at uh, four or five, you can maybe even do some, um, just, you know, just some little pieces of allograph uh, packet, um, and then go in the back and uh, uh, do multiple osteotomies throughout, and probably be pretty good. Uh, hard to tell if you quite get there where you want to be, though, looking at these. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's great. Um, and you know, I, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, as you all know, there's, there's different ways to to attack this problem. The one thing that I always keep in mind in treating MPS uh, patients is that they are not necessarily the healthiest uh, patients. They have, um, you know, involvement in just about all the organ systems. And so, whatever surgical um, approach or surgical uh, uh, strategy that I design for them, I try to design one that I can do a very efficient and, and limit the amount of anesthesia and the amount of operative uh, time as well. And I think that a lift is, is perfectly uh, perfectly reasonable in this patient combined with a posterior approach. Um, I, uh, this is what she looks like clinically. And you can see um, her uh, sagittal myalignment, how it's manifested uh, clinically, she's quite miserable. So um, <clears throat> what I decided to do actually I decided to do an all posterior. Um, I uh, took advantage of the vacuum disc uh, at 5'1", so I did just a uh, T-lift at 5'1", and I did an uh, osteotomy at uh, PSO at L4. Um, and I did not go approximately because I knew that that thoracic low doses that you see here is, is, is strictly compensatory because of the lumbar kyphosis. So, and oftentimes you see this in patients who have that compensatory thoracic -like, um, low doses, once you restore um, lumbopelvic uh, alignment, oftentimes that uh, thoracic lordosis will convert, will, uh, will uh, fix itself. And so I was uh, fairly confident that I'll be able to uh, realign the spine without having to go higher than, uh, the, than her original um, you know, UIV. So uh, this is uh, what her clinical uh, images uh, look like. So um, I had some slides uh, to, uh, go through the PSO uh, technique, but I, I don't think that that's necessary unless, I don't know if we have time for me to do that or even if it's, if it's necessary. I'm not sure what the audience is, is like to do so. What do you guys think? Yeah, go, go for it. We all have slightly different techniques. Uh, I, I'm sure we'd all be happy to hear yours for this. Okay, great. All right, so typically, um, I start with uh, meticulous exposure with excellent hemostate. This is so critical because I always uh, tell my residents and fellows, you cannot lose all your blood during the exposure because then the game is over. You want to preserve that blood loss towards the uh, decancellation part of where you cut in the wedge because that's when uh, the bleeding uh, typically starts. So I'm always there in the room uh, for the exposure for these um, big cases because we got to control uh, the blood loss. Uh, after uh, um, exposure uh, then uh, and placement of instrumentation, then do a wide laminectomy from uh, pedicle above to pedicle below of the site of the level of osteotomy. Oftentimes this is done for revision cases. So there's often um, substantial scar tissue formation, which you have to take the time to thin the scar because when you close your osteotomy, if the scar tissue is, is bulky, it will compress the, the, the fecal sac and you may have issues uh, with that. So there are times when I've actually had to resect the scar tissue and reconstruct the dura just to make it less bulky. Uh, working from the medial pedicle wall where it's less stuck is, is, uh, is a useful trick um, in the beginning. Uh, then the next step is to skeletonize the pedicle, uh, detach the transverse process, but don't completely remove it. Just, just de detach it to give you enough room to go uh, and dissect in the lateral vertebral wall in a subperiosteal dissection. 
Now, I've had a couple of cases where in the process of doing a subparesal dissection, it's very easy to plunge, um, you know, uh, to plunge. So you just want to be careful uh, during this step. And also watch out for the segmental artery in the, in the mid of uh, the tibial body. Uh, at this time, once you've isolated the vertebral body, um, uh, the level of interest, then you resect your bone in a triangular fashion. I typically will use osteotomes uh, to do this. Uh, when I start resecting, taking out a pedicle, I will place a temporary rod on the contralateral side to prevent inadvertent subluxation. I saw one of these in, in fellowship, and it was, it was not good. Um, and then um, uh, you want to prepare for bleeding. This is where the bleeding uh, occurs. Once I've cut my osteotomies, and I've gotten deep, and I've gotten deep uh, enough. This is when I'll use a diamond bird to um, sort of thin the, the anterior cortex uh, so that it will allow me to close my osteotomy. The diamond takes, it's less efficient, but it decreases the blood loss and it, it allows me, and it also can be forgiven. The key thing about the PSO technique is you don't want to resect a, uh, a rectangle. If you do a rectangular sort of carpentry work, then that will limit uh, your amount of correction and it just, you lose uh, significant style points in doing so. Um, and um, inadequate uh, resection, especially the anterior portion of the tibial body uh, will limit your ability to close the osteotomy. Uh, and then finally, uh, you have to remove the dorsal cortex. Uh, you may encounter some epidural bleedings uh, at this stage, so, uh, so prepare for that and uh, don't get a ventral derotomy. <laughs> um, if you get it, you, you can still deal with it, but it's just very, very annoying because keep in mind, at this stage, you're very, this is, this is towards the latter part of the day, you're tired. This is not the time the way you have a ventral derotomy and you have to find a way uh, to fix it. So just be careful at this stage where you're removing that, that ventral, um, the posterior uh, cortex. And you close to us the anatomy. So this is what the um, x-ray is what she looks like now. And uh, so far, uh, we haven't, knocking on wood, we haven't had any uh, issues um, with her. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention about taking care of um, uh, you know, patients with MPS syndromes, uh, the Hurlis patients that I've taken care of, a special group of, of, of human beings, special group of folks. Um, and I think part of it is because at the early age, they've been involved in the hospital system. They know how to interact with the hospitals. They know how to interact with physicians and they are super, super appreciative of the care and they become part of your family, essentially. A lot of the, the, the kids have my cell phone number. They oftentimes will send me a text. I'll send them a text to check on them, how they're doing in school or if they have any sort of part-time job that they're doing. And, and so it's, it's been really an honor and a privilege to, to take care of them. So I encourage any of you, if, if you're uh, if 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 you any if you if you come in contact and to or you've put in a position to take care of um, uh, any kid with um, MPS syndromes, just put, accept the challenge. Take your time, do a good job, and and they, they will love you forever, and you will love them too. Very very special group of folks. All right. So last case I'll uh, present is the case of a proximal junctional kyphosis. Uh, this time with myelopathy. The last two cases that I've presented. We're all uh, neurologically intact, but uh, this time this patient um, presented with uh, some pretty severe neurological uh, deficit. So, 14 uh, year old uh, history of her list. Uh, her bone marrow transplant was done when she was one year old. Uh, she presented with two years of progressive bilateral lower extremity weakness, had difficulty walking. Uh, she was using a walker to uh, walk um, and having se severe um, problems standing upright with a hump in the back as well. Uh, now, prior to seeing me, she had undergone a T9 to L5 uh, fusion. Uh, and so this is what her construct looked like uh, when she saw me, uh, uh, pre is to the left and uh, to the right, uh, her x-rays. So five, she did relatively well until five years post-op. So she saw me, her surgery was 2014, she saw me in 2019. And you can see the, the dramatic, um, uh, uh, proximal junctional uh, kyphosis or proximal junctional failure that she's developed with her neurological complaint. So at this stage, an MRI was done. Uh, you can see it's kind of subtle, but there's some signal within um, the spinal cord at that level that the UIV here is T9. And so T89, the spondylolisthesis, uh, anterolisthesis at T89 with um, compression of the of the spinal cord or the spinal cord being draped at that level with some T2 signal changes 
leading to uh, leading um, to her neurological complaints and uh, weakness in her legs. So this is what a CT looks like. You can see that. alluded to. to, to um, proximal thoracic spine and then I, I knew I had to um, to do an adequate decompression of, of the spinal cord. So I, I thought the only way I can do a good job here was to do a vertebral column resection. And so I did a VCR at uh, T9, uh, which is this um, level here. So this bone had to, uh, T9 vertebra had to come out and then I extended her up to T4. Um, and so this is just a technique VCR, I'll skip that. Uh, and so this is what uh, we are able to do for her. I think now she's about a year post-op. Um, she is doing okay so far, but uh, as I've shown in, in other images, uh, this is uh, certainly not the, probably not the last procedure that she's going to have. Um, so this is the last case. Um, I, I do have a video just for some of the trainees um, that are on the, in the audience of uh, a VCR uh, technique in a similar case of how I typically uh, do my VCR. So I'm going to see if I can play that uh, video of an example of a VCR in, in a similar uh, patient, but not this particular patient. So let me see if I can open it. Uh, by the way, any comments on, on, the, on that case? Yeah, Isaac, that, that, that looks fantastic. I'm sorry, I, I lost you guys for a few seconds. I just lost internet. That looks amazing. I'm curious, what kind of graft did you place there in your VCR defect? Uh, BMP. But what is what is the cage that you placed there? Is that is that a titanium cage? Like what what is that? Yeah, that's a a, a titanium uh, uh, titanium cage. That's correct. Okay. All right. So let's see. Is the video playing? It's not. I think you might need to switch uh, the screen you're sharing. Oops. Okay. One second. Um, your screen sharing is paused. So what do I do? Do a new share? Yeah, I think you stop. I think you're supposed to stop sharing and then reshare. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. All right. Good. All right, so this is a similar case of, uh, of a patient that needed a VCR revision. Um, screws are, are now, um, screws have, old screws have been removed, new screws have been replaced. I, for the first three or four years of my practice, um, I didn't use navigation, but now almost exclusively I use NAV for all of my cases, um, especially intraoperative CT confirmation is, is a must uh, for me. Uh, the NAV is, is super, super helpful. Um, for me, especially in, uh, in treating these patients. So uh, here, uh, we're moving the rib, the many ways to, uh, in, in terms of uh, doing this. So we're doing a costal transvasectomy uh, step here. Uh, this is the uh, rib has been resected. Uh, patties now are placed to protect uh, the pleura. Um, this was through a fusion mass. And so, um, had to remove that the posterior bone there. And it's a durotomy here that had to be reconstructed with a patch. Um, and then uh, a temporary rod now is shown on the left side. Uh, here I am uh, sacrificing the, the nerve root. I think this was also a T9 um, VCR. 
Um, <clears throat> same thing here. So for my VCRs, um, depending on the case, uh, I do, the diamond is still a go-to uh, tool for me because it limits the amount of blood loss, although you know, it takes a little bit of time and it fatigues your hand. Um, but sometimes I also use osteotone, but uh, a bone scalpel is also a very good um, tool to use for this. Uh, so you can see here, I'm working uh, underneath, underneath the spinal cord with, um, with the diamond. This is what it looks like on the CT reconstruction. So now um, I began my uh, closure of the osteotomies using uh, compression um, with two uh, temp rods and, um, and a rod gripper. Obviously doing neuromonitoring uh, is very critical in this and you wanna make sure that you don't over uh, 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 compress here. You don't wanna close too much. All right, after I'm satisfied with my closure, now the uh, cage uh, comes in. All right, you see me with the Woodson. I'm checking both the proximal and distal aspect of the laminectomy defect to make sure that there's no kinking or, or anything uh, that will uh, cause a problem. And actually, this patient was non ambulatory prior to the surgery, and this is her in clinic um, walking. This is uh, maybe uh, six weeks post op or so. So, um, so that's pretty much the, what I wanted to share today. Uh, basically, um, it's, it's always the, a pleasure to take care of patients with uh, MPS. They're a great group of, of, of patients. They love their physicians. They love their surgeons. Um, and they've been through a lot since day one, since they were born. So they, they, have a, they are actually very, very mature um, and they are willing to work with you. So, um, so if you're given a chance to, to take care of them, um, I think you, you'll be very happy. Um, and the first surgery is never the last one. Um, they will continue to have issues and you, can, you will continue to have to take care of them. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present these cases. Thank you, Isaac. Um, those, uh, those was a really great discussion. Um, any, any questions for Dr. Kakari? Let's see, I'm gonna check the chat box real quick. Isaac, I have a quick question for you. When you're closing your VCR osteotomy, do you ever place your cage before you compress to use it as the fulcrum? It looked like you did your compression, then you place your cage afterwards. So is, is there any difference in the chronology of events there? No, I typically do not, especially, um, usually I will, you know, I'll compress, compress. Um, and then by the time I get enough of my compression, uh, that typically, um, uh, or, or I'm limited by neuromodular changes or I'm limited by bulking of, of the spinal cord, uh, that's when I stop. And then my next, um, my next force application then will be a cantilever. Uh, once I put my final rod in a cantilever, that's what actually is what gives me most of my correction. Then after that, my cage is always the last, um, always the last uh, 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 step for me. But your point is well valid. Uh, I've seen folks do VCRs where they place the cage first, use it as a fulcrum, just like you uh, suggested. So I think it's just a it's just a choice in terms of technique, but it's it's also very valid. Yeah, Mike, that's what I that's what I tend to do. I know you do a fair amount of this as well. What's uh, what what do you do, Mike? I I typically do that too. Uh, I'll typically place the cage first, and then I'll compress across it just to use it as a fulcrum. Yeah, the the problem is that sometimes I don't know. Um, I don't know how much gap I'm going to be left with. Um, and so I don't know, sometimes I don't know the, the, the size of the cage or the perfect size of the cage, unless you're using an expandable cage. I use a titanium expand, uh, titanium cage there, but uh, a lot of times I use the harms cages. And so, sometimes with the harms cages, you don't know exactly how to cut it or in terms of the, 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 the size to cut it till the very end. So, um, but placing the cage is also a very good option like you've described. Any other questions for Isaac? Well, Isaac, that was really great. I think if you look at the check, uh, uh, text box, you'll see a lot of uh, admiration for your, for your cases and your presentation. So um, I really, really appreciate uh, your, your time and um, you know, we'll, we'll really miss you here at Duke, but uh, looking forward to having you again when you're part of the Oklahoma faculty. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. I hope awesome. everyone has a great night. You too.